I think 24 one day will get resurrected. It won't be. I, I, I think the future of 24 is in a couple of years when there is a new team of writers, a new team of producers, directors, and a new uh, Jack Bauer. And I think that's where it will live, sort of like my friend Peter Lankoff's show, Hawaii Five O, came on 25 years after, reinvented it, and did it. I, I mean, I'm retired. Bob is, you know, works when he wants to work. Losa. I mean, this group that was the creative force behind it won't probably be doing 24 that way. But 24 in real time is such a great uh, conceit and such a great concept for any show that uh, I do hope one day that somebody who has the ability to, to crack the code of the show can do it because I think it adds so much. I mean, we took an ordinary kind of an action show and by making it real time, we created something that TV no, almost never gets, which is suspense. And that's uh, that's where I think the real value is. So, well, Gary, welcome to the welcome to the panel. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, I guess I have a question for you. Uh, so many shows, you know, make it to air and don't make it to air. So, uh, what was it about Twenty Four that you and Dana Walden at the time said, "All right, Twenty Four needs to go to air"? And what made you guys? support it throughout its whole run, basically. So, first of all, at when 24 was developed, Dane and I were running the studio, not the network. So we were selling the show to the network. I, I remember sitting in a staff meeting and a, uh, one of our young creative executives um, was talking about the shows that we were developing. And he said, you know, we've got this show from Imagine and Joel Cernow that is going to be done in real time. And everyone in the room, there's maybe 35 people in the room and just look at them like, you know, what is he talking about? And, you know, the questions you would expect about, well, how can that be? What if he needs to sleep, go to the bathroom, drive across town? And, and, uh, and so, you know, it was pretty quickly put on the back burner as not a particularly viable project. And then went through the development process and this incredible script came in. And um, everyone from the studio, the network got extremely excited about it. Um, and then the pieces started coming together, the final piece being Kiefer. And uh, all of a sudden this became, um, you know, a, a project with a huge amount of potential. I remember when the cut came in um, and uh, the studio gets it before the network. And um, I watched it at home as, you know, we, we did back then. And uh, Dane and I got on the phone with each other and said, holy shit, this thing's unbelievable. And, uh, and from that point on, it really was kind of charmed. It just glided through the system. It was the best pilot the network had that year. Um, and, um, and even though it was such an unusual uh, structure for storytelling, uh, the, you know, that was a plus. That was not an impediment. And it uh, got right on the schedule. Oh, my God. Hey, honey. How are you? Well, they have real names, but we call them Terry and Kim. You Happy can call me Kim. Keeper. You can call me Kim. That's fine. I'm good with it. How are you? Good. Where are you? Leslie, you start. I'm in Langley. I'm near Vancouver, Kiefer. Oh, my gosh. There you are. How are you? I'm good. How are you, sweetheart? You look beautiful. I'm great, thank you. I'm great. Where are you? I am in my secret lair. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm actually home. I'm in Toronto. Oh, how nice. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Thank you. And you. <laughs> what are you doing in Langley, Virginia? I'm directing here. I'm on a, a gig here that has me here for another couple of weeks. And oh, I'll be back again in March. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's so nice to see you. You too. Were you blushing this morning? We were all singing your praises this morning without you. Oh, well, that's, thank you very much. And, and well, and back at you. It's, it's uh, you know, we, Rachel and I were talking earlier and, and uh, she asked me which was my favorite season. And, and I love, in all fairness, I loved all of them, but there's not, you know, the first season's the first season. And it's when we kind of discovered everything uh, for the show. And I just, you know, just brought back so many kind of sweet memories, so. 
Yeah. yeah. No, Can you no. believe it's been 20 years? <laughs> oh, no. come on. Man, that's like getting hit in the face with a shovel. <laughs> but you two look a really right. soft shovel. A soft shovel. Mint condition, well, both of you. I saw Alicia this morning and you too, Keeper. Mint. Well, I've, I've been embalmed. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, boy, it, 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 it's 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 good to have the family back together. We were saying, <laughs> Kiefer, we were saying earlier, if Alicia hadn't climbed out the window, none of us would be here today. She, well, she, yes, and there's, she there, and there was always that. I, I remember having conversations with Howard Gordon right to the bitter end, which was, why doesn't anybody just do what I say? <laughs> People would just do what I say. No one would be in trouble. And, uh, and we would laugh about that a lot. Um <laughs> That's for Keeper and Jack Bauer. So it, it's so funny to see Alicia because, you know, she was so young when we started. Yeah. And it was amazing to watch, uh, just watch her grow up over the years uh, in doing the show and just watching her career blossom and, and all of this stuff. And it was just, uh, but it, it was very funny because I, I have a dog uh, who is just a couple of years younger than Alicia. And so it was very interesting for me because I felt, you know, I had a daughter at home. And then when I went to work, I, I, I actually felt very protective over Alicia, uh, uh, like a father would. And yeah. so, and she was just so amazing. So nice to see you again. It's so good to see you. And it's so funny because it's interesting. I, I always would be cautious about, you know, going on other shows after we, my time on 24 was over because I'd always, all my, all my references would be the show. And I, I never wanted to come across that I was like bragging about being on this like big show, but that was my only experience. And I think we kind of touched on it earlier where when we were shooting 24, the hours and the time we spent together was, it, it was so much like a fishbowl. I, I, I would go home, sleep, come back. And it would be, you know, this, they were my family. They were, yeah. they were who I, you know, spoke to on a daily basis. I mean, there was, there was no time for socializing or going to dinners. I mean, it was, it was, it was a lot to do with my time. Those, those four years were so dedicated to, to, to being on that set. And it was such a huge um, influence on my career and, and Kiefer too, especially um, like, I can't thank you enough because every show after that, you know, the benchmark of being, you know, the head guy and setting the tone for a series the way you did stuck with me you know sometimes it was blatant advice and sometimes it was just me watching you you know conduct yourself oh. and be so prepared and um thank you and, and so like yeah and and really made the other actors accountable you know so it was like later on it kind of trickled into all my work and you know how to how to be and how to be professional and uh just you know without oh, it i mean i wouldn't you. be the actor that I am. I mean, it just, you put such a stamp on, on me, you know, professionally. Oh, so thank you. Thank you from, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. So there's this, there's this hour pilot you watch and the show's called 24. That means there's 23 more hours to cover. Did you have any concerns about that format or being able to keep that real time going? That may be the understatement of, I mean, it, it was, <laughs> it was, I, I think we all felt like we were on this high wire and it was really from episode to episode and then from season to season. And, you know, 24 episodes is just too much to look at all holistically. So, I, you know, I think it, it quickly became understood that if we had a very good base and it was an interesting um, foundation, we'd find our way across this impossible thing. But I do think that every year we felt, oh, wow, we survived that. There's no way we can do this again. <laughs> and, I, mean, I mean, really, it was really like, when is it time to get out of this Ponzi scheme in a way? Like, how do we, how do we pull it ahead? <laughs> and the show kind of, you know, it ebbed and it flowed for sure. And we had our better seasons that, and, our, and our worst seasons. But I think it's something we are all incredibly proud of having uh, been part of. And I think, you know, its impact, I think, you know, not to overstate it, 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 it had, a, it was a, a lot, first for a lot of things, the show. In terms awesome. of narratively, you know, standalone episodes versus, you know, we had to navigate that. The conventional wisdom at the time was, we're, we're not doing this as a serialized show, of course, are we? And, you know, Joel and Bob had the, you know, wisdom to say no, of course, having every intention. <laughs> just which, 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 and ignoring set, which set the tone for binge watching for me and all, all the great shows that have come after. all. This. John, I'm going to start with you. What made you want to write a book about 24? Oh, uh, oh interesting question. Uh, basically, there were a bunch <laughs> of photographers on set, Rodney being one of them. Uh, and the crew, basically, Joseph, everyone were always taking pictures. And, and it was, we were in our fifth year. Actually, we had finished our fifth year. 
And I thought, you know, 24 fans, I mean, look, we always connected to the internet. We always we were on the boards. If you remember the boards, we were on the 24 boards, always talking to fans and we knew how much they loved the show. So it really was just a, all of us got together and said, what if we put all our pictures that we've been taking for years, for five years now and put them all in a book and tell some behind the scenes stories. And, and that's how it came about. And then everyone contributed and it was great. And the thing I loved about the book the most too, at the very back, is every single person that had anything to do with those five years. From, from Brian Grazer to Imagine to the craft service people. And mm -hmm. I thought that was like the most important thing because yeah, the actors are up front and even the directors get a little bit of buzz, but it's all those people behind the scenes that, that made this show so special. And we were truly a family. So to me, that book was always like a family album that we could all look back on and just go, look, look, look at what we did. Look how much fun this was. And so that's kind of where it came about. What was your best memory of working on 24? Oh man, That's, <laughs> I mean, I married the director's kid. So I'm <laughs> gonna go with my wedding, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and my son being born. But when I was actually on the show, I just had so many incredible memories. Um, but I remember that the, I remember the first time I knew Kiefer was okay with me being there. That was that was a pretty amazing memory because I was I was pretty terrified to be on the show. I hadn't done as much as everyone else, and everyone was so incredibly established and and people I really admired. And I was being tortured, you know, as you do on Twenty Four. And um, <laughs> I I had only I was supposed to only come on for a few episodes, and I had my storyline had continued a few extra episodes, and that was really exciting for me. And I was being tortured and it was the first scene I was in with Kiefer and we were in the White House and uh Tony Todd was had a gun to my head and I was bawling and crying and it was over and then very quietly like a ninja Kiefer walked over I didn't even know he was there and then he like just whispered next to my face very good job mm -hmm. and then he walked away and I was like oh, oh I did it it's amazing <laughs> so that was pretty great <laughs> Laura, hi. Hi, beautiful. Yeah. I just want to cry. I've, I've I just... <laughs> we've connected so much over the years, you know, yeah. different shows we've worked on and being single moms and and yeah. um, I just love you so I'm going to cry. Yeah, I I, you, I, I that, that's great. That, that's, that's normal. It's okay. Families cry. It's okay. And look how we started, you know, you were my yeah. little bad terrorist little sister. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, it's crazy. The Warner Sisters, the war, you know. Oh my God. From I'm season so four. Oh, sorry. From season four, we had. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, just, just gonna introduce you all, and then I'm gonna let you all loose. Um, from season four, we have Shora Agdashlo, and we have Nestor Serrano, uh, who played the family de Aras, Navi and Dina Aras. Welcome, welcome, you two. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And we have from season eight, we have uh, Nekar Sadegan and we have Nasnin Contractor. Welcome, another family who played Dahlia <laughs> and Kaila Hassan. Mm -hmm. And we have the great Annie Wershing who played yeah. Renee Walker. One, I think one of the uh, fan favorites of the show, uh, uh, Renee is yeah. very, very much loved by, by lots of fans. And I'm obviously own, we have- I'm in my own little family by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Greg who's been here. Uh, Greg, you've For been hours. here all day, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have John. Uh, John, it's a pleasure to, to, to chat with you too. I'm just listening. <laughs> no, no, John. It, it, What's you up, can brother? jump in anytime. I mean, this is this is your party, like like Ryan was saying. So, um, I live in Iceland now, and uh, I, the show was very popular here, and and I do get recognized a lot. And one guy who, who was sort of in his cups one night came up and Silverov, Silverov, and starts speaking Icelandic to me. <laughs> <laughs> Expecting you would, would respond. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I still remember the I still remember the two lines of because I had to speak different languages. Uh, one was Admin Buddha's Roblenu no Proto Hochodino. And there was a dialect coach, and I, I swear to God, every time I did a take, 
I was spot on. And he'd come over and go, no, chochodino. And I'd go, chochodino. Oh, go, no, chochodino. <laughs> and this would go on for about 10 minutes. I still don't think I can get the line right, but I remember it. <laughs> oh, I've got a good one. <laughs> I've got one. Uh, there was a scene where I, my limousine has just been blown up and I'm walking away from <laughs> the other phone. And uh, I'm... You know, I'm talking to some one of my people, uh, and uh, they said, "Just speak some Russian while you're walking away." Now I don't speak Russian, so they said, well, I just make it up." You know, just speak gibberish. So I'm like, "When you get gibberish, you go all nonsense." Nobody ever busted me on it. Now here's the thing: they told me that they were going to replace it in post. And now we'll get another actor when, when we do ADR to a, a Russian and, and we'll put real Russian in there. Never did it, never busted on it. You can hear. And also we were at, uh, Kathleen Gotti and I were at Glenn Morshower's house. We used to watch the show every week. Uh, some oh, of us cool. get together that's cool. and uh, which was great. And uh, that scene comes in and I was like, I can't believe they left that in. Oh my God. Now <laughs> Kathleen speaks Russian. And she said, what do you mean? I said, that's, I'm speaking fake Russian. She said, oh, really? I thought you were speaking real Russian. <laughs> so I fooled her somehow. And, you know, I, I, I've just never been busted on it, which amazes me. Bravo. What do you say, Bob? Yeah, I do. I think that's a good point. Uh, the whole premise of Nikita was uh, this woman who, on our show, unlike the movie, was innocent. She was not a killer. She was innocent. It was a mistake. And she was having to constantly do things she didn't want to do that went against her natural impulses, but she had to do them to survive. And that created a, a tension in the show that was there every episode. That wasn't exactly the tension of 24, but we still carried over the idea, I think, that uh, of a hero doing things that he didn't really want to do, but he had to do to save his family, to save innocent people, to overcome some horrible uh, evil that was going to descend on the world. He did not enjoy doing what he was doing, he had to do it. And that created a tension within the character, I think, which was more interesting, as Joel says, than just uh, running around and shooting. Right, it wasn't James Bond, where it's just a, a good yeah. guy going after bad guys. So yeah. what we always try to do on 24 is build family units around all our main characters, whether it was Jack or Palmer, so that every story had some inner tension to do with families, husbands and wives, uh, daughters and fathers, things like that, that added to the, the t you know, again, that was learned from Nikita in realizing you could do a thriller thing and it's also a romance, it's a love story. So uh, that was a really uh, interesting parallel. And then when we got to 24 after Nikita, we were versed in the idea that you have to surprise the audience with your plots. You have to keep. You have to keep it unexpected. You have to always pull the rug out from from the viewer and let them know that what you're seeing is not what you think you're seeing. And we did that a lot on Nikita, and we did that a lot on Twenty Four. 